And there's gonna be things when you're trying your fresh start, trying to move forward, trying to get ahead and you're running and something's gonna mess up and you're gonna throw up and you're gonna get sick and things aren't gonna go the way you want. And you need somebody to say, wipe off your mouth and keep going. And they need to be able to speak truth to say, you're not gonna die, but you gotta move. You wanna go forwards. You wanna push ahead through the pain and through the heartache and deal with it. So how many of you guys are looking forward to the new year? Yeah, we, I asked this earlier. Come on, you guys are better than that. So I want to start out by saying, you know, every year, I, this is one of my favorite times of the year because as a Browns fan, there's always next year. So this is this year, right? So uh, as we're starting the new year, there's a lot of people that do uh, New Year's resolutions, looking for fresh starts, new beginnings. And maybe that's you. How many of you guys are doing a... New Year's resolution, anyone, if we're honest? A couple of us, all right, in the room. They can be <clears throat> challenging. One of the most uh, disappointing things about New Year's resolutions, about 90% of them fail. And so happy, happy Sunday to you guys that are starting. But there's a reason that they fail. Uh, and hopefully today we're going to talk a little bit about, about that. The idea of a fresh start gets me excited, and I look at my life and I look backwards on it and maybe you're like me and you wish you had a reset button. Like if you look past in your past, you see the different decisions you've made, attitudes that you've carried, uh, habits that you formed, maybe even addictions that were created. And then you wish you could just hit a reset button. Anybody here? Maybe a financial decision when you were young, relationship that you shouldn't have been in. If you could go back and talk to young you, what would you tell young you. They say that wisdom is wasted on the young. And I I like to say that, or uh, youth is wasted on the young. I say wisdom is wasted on the old, right? No. But what if we could get like our young people to understand what we know? Like what, like I think like if I could go back and talk to young Eddie Carter, what would I tell him? Like what would the things that I would, I would definitely be like, look, you should go to school on Fridays. Like that's part of the school week. You should do that. Uh, I would tell I would tell him like, hey, you should care much less about what everybody else thinks of you, and you should care more about what God thinks of you. Like I would tell myself that. Anybody else in the room feel that one? Thank you. Um, I would tell uh, young me. Don't make that purchase. I know that you really think that that car is really cool, but probably not wise. But the reality is, I could probably tell a much older Ed Carter some similar things, if we're honest. So the reset button doesn't have to go back to 16 through 25-year-old me. I can look back on recent history and be like, man, I was such a bonehead. I can't believe I said that. I wish I had a reset button to be able to go back into that moment three weeks ago and say, don't do that. Don't make your dumb enough financial decisions. Don't, don't make it. So the question that I would ask you is, have you ever wanted to rewrite a part of your past? Because oftentimes it's the things that happen in our past that create these cycles and these loops in our lives that we tend just to live out over and over and over and over again. And we can't escape that part of our life. It sets off like a chain reaction. Bad relationships, choices, maybe they cheated or you cheated. Poor financial decisions that make you play catch up and make you make another bad decision and another bad decision and another bad decision. And it hurts and it's hard. Things that are said or not said. And then because of that, you kind of get this identity that's formed because of your past. Some people live in in the past and their mistakes and their grief and their regrets. And some people live in the past, even in their successes. Like maybe... It's Joe, who was the greatest football player in such and such high school history. And so as Joe looks back on his past, he sees all of this success and happiness that ended when he was 18 years old. And he lives the rest of his life thinking about the good old days and not 
looking ahead and he thinks that today is terrible because of that. Or maybe it's not Joe, but it's Linda who got pregnant her freshman year in high school. And she's just been burdened with this identity of that. And the people that went to school with her never forget that's who she is. It's Linda, the girl that got pregnant her freshman year. You know her. Or maybe it's Sam, the guy that stole the company's retirement accounts. Or Sally, the one who cheated with her neighbor. Or Jack, who was the neighbor. See, we all have pasts and we all have things that we've done and things that give us even an identity to people. In Mark chapter five, there's a story about a man who lived in a graveyard. Said that he was chained hand and foot, but the chains couldn't hold him and he would break the chains. And so I'm assuming that that meant that they would have to rechain him up over and over and over again. Scripture says that he was strong enough that nobody could subdue him. And he was possessed by demons that tormented him seemingly all the time. So day after day after day, he was in anguish and he would cry out and he would cut himself. Can you imagine what must have been in this man's past? See, scripture doesn't tell us what was in his past. They don't say what was a series of decisions that led to him being chained up in the graveyard. Can you imagine like as a parent, you walk by the graveyard, you're with your kids and you're like, you don't play with the guy in the graves. Like that's probably what the guy was called, the guy in the graves. It's probably what he was known. And there was probably stories about what caused him to be there. And parents in the community probably told the stories like, you don't want to be like the guy in the graves. And that was probably his life. Living in torment because of the demons of his past. Whatever it was, however it was that he got those demons, he lived in the midst of death and pain and suffering and anguish. Like I said, the Bible doesn't say why or how he became like that just says that's where he was. The roads that he led down, or roads that he went down led right there. And so many, how many of us feel trapped by our past? Maybe not to that extent, but look back and say, man, everything that I've done has led me here and I can't move forward. So day after day, you live connected to the grave markers of your past, the mistakes and the regrets. And and then at the beginning of every year, you say, this year's going to be different. Everything's gonna change. It's a new start, a new beginning. It's a fresh start. But then by March, it's just back to the way everything always is. Oftentimes when people look to move forward, they say, I'm just gonna forget about the past. But in reality, you just can't. At some point, you have to deal with your past. To get past it, you have to put it away and file it and move on. And you cannot do that by just ignoring it. So if I would ask you this question, what is something negative in your past that you've not been able to leave behind? What is something negative in your past that you look back on and you find part of you, even your identity wrapped up in that decision, in that mistake, or that maybe it wasn't even your fault, maybe it was an abuse, somebody abused you or whatever, but in your past, there's something negative that you have not been able to leave behind. What is it? What is it? And for some of you in the room, it's given you your identity. You made that mistake and maybe you cheated and you've been known as a cheater. Maybe you lied and you've been known as a liar. Whatever it is, Maybe somebody as you were growing up just called you stupid and you've lived with that your entire life. And so one thing that I want to speak into you is what you have done isn't your identity. What you are done isn't your identity. Because when you begin to allow what you've done to become your identity, you put a label on you and you relabel yourself. And you allow whatever it is that you've done to consume who you are and you can't move past it. And so what label do you wear? What do you call yourself besides your name? This might be something that you've been called when you were younger and it's just carried on, something that you believe about yourself. But when you're honest with yourself and you really do a self-evaluation, this is what you say about you. Because of my past, I am this. I want to challenge you to leave that behind today. 
I want you to walk away from that. See, in the story of the graveyard, there was a man in deep pain. Then something happens. Jesus shows up. Jesus shows up and the demons run away. He casts them out and, and puts them into some pigs and they run off and they drown themselves. And so in this story, there's this man in great pain and anguish and torment and Christ walks into the picture and the man is freed. And all of the demons of his past are put into the pigs and they die. And Jesus literally puts his demons to death. Gets him, rids this man of that. And there's an interaction between Jesus and the man. And it goes like this in uh, chapter 5, starting verse 18. It says, as Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. And Jesus did not let him. But he said, go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell uh, in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. All the people were amazed. Now imagine that you're this guy and for however long you've lived in the graves and the people of your community had chained you up, you'd broken out, they chain you up, you, you break out. They're terrified of you. They tell the stories of you. And all of a sudden you're free and your mind is free and it's clear and you can make sense of the way that life is supposed to go for you. And so the person that did that for you, Jesus, is standing there. You see him getting ready to leave and you're like, hey, let me go with you. And his response is no, no. I want you to go and tell people what I've done for you. And we think that's easy, right? Like we think like, do you know how much of this man's past he would have to deal with just by walking into the city? Just by making the journey down and saying, hey, let me tell you something. They're like, no, thank you. You're the crazy guy in the grave. Like no way. Like all the kids are probably still running away scared. But Jesus drives out the demons and gives him a calling. And so he probably changed his identity. He, he became the man who used to be in the graves. He, he's the man that used to be chained up. And maybe, just maybe, he becomes the preacher. Maybe he becomes, you know, the man of second chances. I don't know what they called him. But in that moment, Jesus took his past and he unchained it and set him free with a new name, a new calling. Everything about the man changes and he got a fresh start. And so that's my hope for you because sometimes I believe our past or your past feels like you're chained to death. I spoke with a, uh, an alcoholic not too terribly long ago. And he told a story that most addicts tell. And it's the cycle of addiction. You do it, you regret it. You you try to make amends, you do it. You regret it, you try to make amends, you do it. You regret it, you try to make amends. And it's this vicious cycle of destruction that most addicts go through. And it's hard and it's crazy and it's difficult. And when you talk to them, the, the feeling that they most have is alone feel alone in the graves, chained to death. It's how they feel. And maybe some of you guys feel that way. And in the story with the man in the graves, there's a line, and then Jesus. And then Jesus. Jesus changed everything. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come and the old is gone. The new is here. There's power in Christ to give you a fresh start, a new beginning. And I think oftentimes you'll hear that at church and you walk out and you're like, yes, there's a new start. I'm going to give my life to Christ, but there's no now what? What do I do next? And so people just kind of you know, float out there. And they're like, but my life hasn't changed at all. And what I want to challenge you today was some really practical insights, hopefully. In Ephesians 4, 22 through 24 says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life. And so I want to stop there and say, with former way of life means that something has changed because there's a former. And so now you're different, okay? 
So your former life, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. And so there's this idea that you have to put off and then to be made new in the attitudes or the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So this Ephesians 4 verse is saying, look, as you walk with Christ, as the Holy Spirit is working within you, there's a change that's happening that you get to take part in. And it's the taking off of who you used to be and the putting on of who Christ wants you to be. And you're an active participant in that process. It's not like one day you're just gonna wake up And God is going to be like, you were here and you were there. No, you're an active participant in your life change. There's there's the active idea that you are going to take off what is sinful in your life and you're going to become more and more holy as you put on what God has for you. There's an actual expectation of change of your behavior. All of us, each and every one of us. A fresh start includes you leaving your past behind. And it's not just the regrets and the pain and the shame. It's also the behavior, the attitudes, and the thought processes. So Jesus deals with your sin and your, and your guilt and your shame. You have to deal with your attitudes and behaviors and your desires. Like you are an active participant in becoming who God wants you to become. So how do we do that? What are some practical things that I would like you to know? In Isaiah 55, verse seven, it says, let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them. And so we have to examine who we are in our thoughts and deeds. And so this year, what is it that you want to accomplish? What is it that you want to accomplish this year? And I ask that question for people who are Christians. Maybe you're like, I want to become closer to Jesus. Great. Maybe you're a non-Christian you're like, and you're like, I just want to examine Christianity more. Maybe you've been a Christian. You're like, I want to become more generous. Maybe you, you're like, I need to take a next step in faith. I would ask you, what is your next step of faith? Because the first thing that I want to tell you, you need to do to get a fresh start that lasts is you need to define the win. We use that question what is the win over and over and over again here at the church? Because it is really a clarifying question. Because if you don't define the win, somebody else will define it for you. And when you aim at nothing, you hit it every time. So if you go into 2023 and you're like, I want something to change, but you don't know what you want to change, you're probably not going to change. So you have to, at some point, on some level, define the win. The example I'll give to you is vacation Bible school. How many of you guys are vacation? Like when you were kids, you'd love vacation Bible school, right? Like vacation Bible school is awesome, right? Everybody loves it. It's great. What's the win of vacation Bible school? It's a tough question, right? To lead kids to Jesus, right? Which kids? What do you mean by that, Ed? All kids, right? And so, but when... So a few years ago, it's probably been 10 years ago, we asked the question, what's the win of Vacation Bible School? And so we sat around as a staff and we said, okay, we want to introduce kids to Jesus. We want to be, it to be an outreach to our community. And, you know, we had all these things. I said, but what if it was one thing, if there was one win, what would it be? And we just narrowed it down and narrowed it down and narrowed it down. And it made VBS completely different. It shifted our focus because we said that the win was bringing unchurched kids to hear about Jesus. That was the win. Unchurched kids to hear about Jesus because churched kids, guess what they hear about? Jesus. So he said, we want unchurched kids to hear about Jesus. And so we went into a week of vacation Bible school. That was the win. And so I said, every night in the evening, I would ask the volunteers, tell me a winning story. Tell me about an unchurched kid that heard about Jesus. At the end of the week, we took a survey and we said, okay, of the kids. And we're like, how many vacation Bible schools did you go to? Are you a member of a church? Do you, like all these things. And what we discovered was like 95% of the kids that came to Marlboro Christian that that week went to either our church or another church. And we're like, man, 
if the win is unchurched kids coming to church to hear about Jesus, we didn't hit a home run. We missed the mark. And people are like, this was a great vacation Bible school. Woo! And I'm like, wait a sec, let's rethink this. And so the next year we repackaged vacation Bible school and we made it a week of sports camps and we advertised it through the schools. And all of a sudden it went from like 95% of the kids were churched kids, maybe not from Marlboro Christian, but from other churches to like 60% of the kids that came didn't go to church anywhere. And it drastically shifted the way that we did vacation Bible school for a season. And we said, okay, when, when you define the win, it changes your behavior. When you define the win, you'll begin to understand. Like if, if the win is to lose weight, you cut calories and you do cardio. But if the, if the goal, if the win is to be healthy, you eat right, sleep right, and exercise. Like when you really define the win, like this is what it's about then you can really get into the the answers to the questions. So what is your win for 2023? And I want you to be as specific as possible. If it's to grow close to Jesus, if it's to spend time with your family, whatever it is that you're like, this is the fresh start that I want in 2023. I I want you to know it and be able to say, this is the win and I'm gonna celebrate those wins. So then the second thing, well, in Proverbs 16, three, it says, commit to the Lord, whatever you do, whatever your win is, commit it to God and he will establish your plans, whatever it is. The second thing I want you to do is seek support. In Proverbs 15, 22, it says, plans fall, fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. Surround yourself with people who want you to succeed, but they love you enough to tell you the truth. See, oftentimes when you talk to people who are struggling in addiction, they say they feel alone, so they don't have people that they're telling the truth to. And the truth is, I fell back into addiction. I'll talk to guys who are addicted to pornography, and no one else in their world knows unless somebody caught them. But in that moment, when they have to deal with the fact that they're addicted to pornography, they're like, I'm not telling anyone, ever. And I'm like, then you're always going to be addicted because you will not get out of the cage alone. You will not. You have to have somebody that's willing to open the cage for you. I do, it's Jesus. And Jesus is telling you, seek counsel. He's telling you, surround yourself with people that can open the cage for you and shut the door for you to tell you, grow up, make wise decisions and speak really hard truth into you. And it's hard to hear because what you want to hear is you're doing great. You're doing wonderful. But you know, how many of you guys have ever run a marathon? Anyone? Brian, you're a marathon runner, right? Yes. Brian and I share that love for running. (laughs) Marathon runners are crazy people. Like, have you ever met a marathon, like a real marathon runner? Is Heath still here? Heath, you're just nuts, man. Like he's a runner. It's like pain. You like run like super marathons, don't you? What's the, bit, the longest marathon you've ever run or distance? 68 miles. How many months? <laughs> how, how long? 24 hours. So like we're going to call you the man in the graves. <laughs> how bad did that hurt? Real bad. Yeah. Do you feel good about that? Yeah, now I do. Right, it's a big deal. Dude, yeah, give that guy a big round of applause. Yeah. What happens to me when I run, and it's happened since I was younger, like at the quarter mile mark, I throw up. Every time. So like I played bas- basketball in college, and so you have to do a lot of training. So we'd get up in the morning, 5.30 in the morning, we'd have to go running. At the quarter mile mark, almost every time, bah, there it goes. So Sue, my wonderful, beautiful wife, decided that we should run the Cleveland Browns 5K, probably, I don't know, probably seven, eight years ago. Linda, you ran that with us, I think. Qu- quarter mile mark, I'm looking for the trash can. Like, I, it's God's way of saying, Ed, you should not be running. Like, this is not your deal. And so I literally want to quit at the quarter mile mark, like every time. 
I'm running and blah, boom, something goes wrong. That is not what I want to happen when I'm running. And there's going to be things when you're trying your fresh start, trying to move forward, trying to get ahead, and you're running, and something's going to mess up, and you're going to throw up, and you're going to get sick, and things aren't going to go the way you want. And you need somebody to say, wipe off your mouth and keep going. Kick you in the butt and move along. Get going. And they need to be able to speak truth to say, you're not going to die, but you got to move. You got to get going. And too many of us want people around us that will say, oh, you just threw up, come on, come on. I'll walk you back to where you used to be. You don't want to go backwards. You want to go forwards. You want to push ahead through the pain and through the heartache and deal with it. Because God has a place for you to go. And so we're going to surround ourselves with people that love us, that want us to succeed, that we're going to tell what we're trying to accomplish. We're going to admit our failures and we're going to move forward. And then we're going to take care of ourselves. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 says, do you not know that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have uh, received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. And every time I read that, I think of like your physical body, which is 100% true. But I also want to talk to you about your mental health and your emotional health. All of that is mission critical for you to move forward. That's why I said like having people around you who can speak truth in love in your life is, is important because they can tell you, you need to slow down. You need to pick it up. You're neglecting your health, your physical health, your mental health, your emotional health. You know what? You, you've been really angry lately. Why? What's going on? Why are you being short with people? And you need to give perm permission for people to walk with you so that you can take care of yourself. So you can be healthy. And first, or then the last thing I want to talk about is connecting with Christ. John 15, 5 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, whoever abides, in, think about that, like this abides, this connected with God. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Like in Christ, we are capable. Separate from Christ, we will accomplish nothing. But Ed, I've been so, no. We're talking about the kingdom of God. The fruit of the spirit comes out when you're connected with Christ. And what is the fruit of the spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those are the things that the spirit of God lived out in your life produces. Not anger and rage selfishness and ego. No, the fruit of the spirit, the things that build the kingdom of God. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those are the fruit that we want to produce. Imagine if we lived in a world where everybody was producing that fruit with one another. If we were patient and loving and caring and kind and hopeful. What would our world look like? This this passage reminds us of the importance of staying connected with God and what he wants in our lives and who he wants us to be and the fruit that he wants us to produce. Because when we're connected with Christ, we're connected to a mission and a vision that is bigger than us. The win of making disciples who make disciples who make disciples. That's the goal. That's the win. Every week we gather around a table, or we gather around together. We used to have a table up here. We don't have it up here anymore. But we take communion together to remember the sacrifice of Jesus that connects us to him. And so we take a little cup, and it's in the pews for you. But we take these cups, and uh, in them is a little wafer. It's a little piece of bread that represents his body that was broken. And so we take it and we eat it and we remember the body that was broken for us. And so we'll do that together. And we take the, the juice that represents the blood that was shed on the cross to pay for our sins, to, to allow us to remain connected to Christ in spite of what we've done in our past. He gives us a new beginning, a fresh start through the blood. And so we drink that together. 
as I was walking off the stage, first service, I noticed that I had spilled a little bit of the juice. And it's like this maroonish color on my hand. And it was just a little bit. And I was like, man, did I cut my hand? And I realized, no, no, there's blood on my hands. And isn't that the point of communion? That Christ took the blood that was on our hands and replaced it with his blood for us. I'm going to pray. The band's going to come back out and sing. And I just ask that you give all that you are to God. Father God, thank you. Thank you for the fresh starts that you've given us, the ability to start fresh, start new. You are the God of second chances and third chances. And Lord, I know there are people in the room right now that feel like they're just stuck in a rut. And I pray, Lord, that you will send your spirit on them and allow them to see a future that's different than their past. I pray, Lord, that you will give them the ability to identify the win that you'll give them the ability to surround themselves with people that can hold them accountable, that they will be truly honest with them. Lord, they'll take care of themselves in their physical, mental, and emotional health. And Lord, I pray that they'll remain connected to you. We lean on you and we love you. We remember the body that was broken and the blood that was shed. And we give all of the praise to Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.